Welcome back. For many, many parts, we examined how events led to the Dance of the Dragons. Long story short, the Hightowers and their allies, the Green Faction, conspired to keep Rhaenys, Daemon, and Rhaenyra off the throne, who over time teamed up and became the Black Faction. And now we're here. The Dance of the Dragons is upon us. And so we began our examination of the war itself, beginning with the Fire and Blood chapter, the Dying of the Dragons, the Blacks and the Greens. Now these coming pages are based on the short story, The Princess and the Queen, published in the short story collection, Dangerous Women, in 2013, the year before the previous material from The Rogue Prince was published. And the title of the original story tells us primarily who it is generally about. The Princess and the Queen are Rhaenyra and Alicent, just as the Rogue Prince was named after who that story was about, Daemon. Actually, the full titles were The Rogue Prince or A King's Brother, a consideration of the early life adventures, misdeeds, and marriages of Prince Daemon Targaryen, as set down by Archmaester Gildane of the Citadel of Old Town, and The Princess and the Queen or The Blacks and the Greens, being a history of the causes, origins, battles, and betrayals of that most tragic bloodletting known as the Dance of the Dragons, as set down by Archmaester Gildane of the Citadel of Old Town. However, as this material was repurposed for Fire and Blood, the titles were removed. In fact, the Rogue Prince, as a term, never appears in Fire and Blood, and the Princess and the Queen appear but once, and not even in the Princess and the Queen section. Which is a shame, as both titles had an ironic flair to them. One can read the Rogue Prince story and see Damon as acting quite dutiful, always supporting his brother and niece. The term Rogue Prince exposes our author's bias right off the bat. And the Princess and the Queen is similar in that Rhaenyra is not even a princess in the story. She's a queen. It's the queen and the queen, and calling Rhaenyra a princess reveals one's opinion on who should sit the Iron Throne. And at the same time, portraying the story as a feud between Alicent and Rhaenyra obscures the real cause of the war. Otto Hightower and his conspiracy, of which Alicent was a member, but hardly its leader. Now, it may be a coincidence, but the Victorian poet Alfred Tennyson wrote a play during the reign of Queen Victoria called The Princess, mocking women's education and what would eventually be known as feminism. And so when viewing the play The Princess as a piece of literature, it's impossible to separate it from the context of Victoria, the Queen. The play is The Princess and the Queen, even if it's only called The Princess. Maybe George R. R. Martin was thinking about this, or maybe it's a coincidence. Regardless, this does get into one of the big causes of the Dance of the Dragons. When one has a female ruler, she is propped up as an example of a strong, educated woman, and that affects society as a whole. Whatever the case, I quite liked the two titles of the stories, and it's a shame they didn't survive. Though, as a consolation, House of the Dragon did name two episodes after these stories. So now, let's get into the text. The Dance of the Dragons is the flowery name bestowed upon the savage, internecine struggle for the Iron Throne of Westeros fought between two rival branches of House Targaryen during the years 129 to 131 AC. To characterize the dark, turbulent, bloody doings of this period as a dance strikes us as grotesquely inappropriate. No doubt the phrase originated with some singer. The dying of the dragons would be altogether more fitting, but tradition and time have burned the more poetic usage into the pages of history, so we must dance along with the rest. And so here we begin with Gildane's overview of the Dance of the Dragons, which is a bit off. So he calls the fight between the Blacks and the Greens the struggle between two rival branches of House Targaryen. Of course, there really isn't any branching to House Targaryen. Aegon and Rhaenyra are half-siblings. There hasn't been time for branching. Not to mention, it doesn't really explain the importance of Daemon and Rhaenys, who would not even be on Rhaenyra's so-called branch. Gildane's description is astoundingly reductionist and paints the war as a simple family feud. Piggybacking on this, the word rival isn't really accurate either. There was a rivalry mentioned in The Rogue Prince, the dubious claim that Alicent's children and Rhaenyra's children were rivals despite the significant age difference and the fact that they didn't live in the same location. But even if we accept this rivalry, Aegon and Rhaenyra were never described as rivals. Aegon didn't even think he should be king until he was convinced after Viserys' death. So, 
Rival branches duking it out is not a really apt description of the dance. The Dance of the Dragons is more accurately a tale of a coup led by Otto Hightower and his faction trying to put their puppet Aegon on the throne ahead of Rhaenyra. Gildane's summary very much tries to divert the blame, which we've been seeing for a long time. It even goes back to part one, where Gildane claims that the war was caused because there was too many Targaryens and it was confusing. And then Gildane does a little trick. He wastes much of the paragraph lamenting the accuracy of the term Dance of the Dragons versus Dying of Dragons. And honestly, who cares about that? But in doing so, the reader is left debating which is more appropriate, dance or dying, rather than examining the truly important information of what the war was and why people were fighting. It wasn't really an internal family dispute, and it wasn't really two branches of Targaryens. And it wasn't some rivalry. It was a Hightower coup. There were two principal claimants to the Iron Throne upon the death of King Viserys I Targaryen. His daughter, Rhaenyra, the only surviving child of his first marriage, and Aegon, his eldest son by his second wife. Amidst the chaos and carnage brought on by their rivalry, other would-be kings would stake claims as well, strutting about like mummers on a stage for a fortnight or a moon's turn, only to fall as swiftly as they had arisen. And so once again, Gildane pushes the idea that Rhaenyra and Aegon were rivals, and their rivalry brought about the war. Except the causation is reversed. Their rivalry didn't bring on the war, the war brought on their rivalry. Otto Hightower and the Green Council's coup brought on the war. Anyway, once again diverting attention, Gildane also brings up other claimants who rose in what is later called the Moon of the Three Kings, the Shepherd, Gaiman Palehair, and Tristan Truefire. Now in the original Princess and the Queen, the reign of these three kings was not fleshed out, which is likely why the paragraph is a little off. The kings didn't really rise amidst the chaos and carnage brought on by Aegon and Rhaenyra. It's more that they arose in the wake of war. Rhaenyra had fled King's Landing and died at this point. This was an after event, really. And if you notice, Gildane mentions the mummers strutting about for a fortnight or a moon's turn. We don't know of anyone who ruled a fortnight. The three kings all ruled about a month. It seems George R. R. Martin wrote this paragraph not knowing exactly what the reigns of the Pretender Kings would be like, and then forgot to edit this paragraph later on for Fire and Blood. But moving on. The dance split the Seven Kingdoms in two, as lords, knights, and small folk declared for one side or the other, and took up arms against one another. Even House Targaryen itself was divided, when the kith, kin, and children of each of the claimants became embroiled in the fighting. Over the two years of struggle, a terrible toll was taken on the great lords of Westeros, together with their bannermen, knights, and small folk. Whilst the dynasty survived, the end of the fighting saw Targaryen power much diminished, and the world's last dragons vastly reduced in number. And finally we get a paragraph that is more or less accurate. The kingdom was split in two with lords, knights, and small folk choosing sides, and House Targaryen was indeed divided, with the children of Aegon and Rhaenyra embroiled and mostly killed by the fighting. I'm including murders here in the definition of fighting. Now it's the last line of that paragraph that is the most interesting. The war saw Targaryen power much diminished and the world's last dragons vastly reduced in numbers. And this is interesting as Archmaester Marwyn specifically accuses the maesters of causing the death of dragons, and Lady Dustin specifically accuses the maesters of conspiring to align houses against House Targaryen, singling out a maester with a Hightower mother, albeit this scheme is at a much later time. As House Hightower was and is a huge patron of the Citadel, and Otto Hightower did lead the coup that started the war, some suspect that there was an Old Town conspiracy that orchestrated the Dance of the Dragons in order to reduce Targaryen power and eliminate dragons. And we are going to be exploring this idea quite a bit going forward. The Dance was a war unlike any other ever fought in the long history of the Seven Kingdoms. Though armies marched and met in savage battle, much of the slaughter took place on water, and especially in the air, as dragon fought dragon with tooth and claw and flame. It was a war marked by stealth, murder, and betrayal as well. A war fought in shadows and stairwells, council chambers and castle yards, with knives, lies, and poison. 
And so here we hear that the Dance of the Dragons was a unique war, with a big reason being that dragon fought dragon. Now this paragraph is still technically correct in that the dance was unique in that it was a large war utilizing land forces, naval forces, and dragons against each other, though the spirit has been diminished some. Since publication of The Princess and the Queen, George R. Martin wrote Sons of the Dragon about the reign of Magor the Cruel. And in that story, we find out that Magor the Cruel, on Beleriand, did have a dragon battle against Aegon the Uncrowned on Quicksilver during the Battle Beneath the God's Eye. Now, Gildane also mentions that the war was marked by more clandestine and nefarious battle tactics, scheming, and betrayals, which is certainly the case. Just to name a few of these darker moments, we have the coup itself, the Cargyle assassination attempt, the blood and cheese incident, the defection of Ulf the White and Hugh Hammer and their murders, and the poisoning of Aegon. But beyond these more obvious events, Gildane's words inadvertently highlight the fact that many more events could have been influenced by scheming, maester scheming, such as Aemond and Luke's meeting at Storm's End, and Boros Baratheon's actions, the peace offer delivered by Orwile, and the execution order of Daemon and Nettles at Maidenpool. Long simmering, the conflict burst into the open on the third day of the third moon of 129 AC, when the ailing, bedridden King Viserys I Targaryen closed his eyes for a nap in the Red Keep of King's Landing and died without waking. His body was discovered by a serving man at the hour of the bat, when it was the king's custom to take a cup of Hippocris. The servant ran to inform Queen Alicent, whose apartments were on the floor below the king's. And so now we start getting into some very unique text. This paragraph and what follows begins to read more like an actual story rather than an ambiguous history, or at least more so than at any other point in Fire and Blood. We are going to see extended dialogue and action, and additionally we'll hear about events where it's not exactly clear how the information is known. And the probable reason for this difference is that these passages were the first things that George R. Martin wrote that would be The Princess and the Queen, and eventually Fire and Blood. He was likely settling into his writing style and hadn't come up with exactly the right voice yet. In fact, in the original Princess and the Queen, there was no dueling historian structure, where Septon Eustace would say one thing and Mushroom would say another, and we would have to figure out what happened. This was largely introduced in The Rogue Prince, and the parts of The Princess and the Queen that have this are later edits by George R. Martin for Fire and Blood. Anyway, with this paragraph, we hear again the notion that the dance was a long-simmering conflict, when in fact it was a coup. Here, a manservant discovers Viserys' body during the hour of the bat, that is, just after sunset, and goes to tell Alicent. We aren't told how anyone would know about the timing and the manservant's actions, but again, when The Princess and the Queen was originally written, sourcing and perspective were not a huge concern. In retrospect, though, we must assume that the manservant either told Septon Eustace or someone else saw the manservant, perhaps a king's guard, and told Septon Eustace. Now here we find out that Viserys regularly drank Hippocras, which is interesting as Hippocras is sweetened wine. And as I've mentioned previously, Sapa was a lead-based syrup used to sweeten things in olden times. But not only that, but the Greek physician Hippocrates of which Hippocrates is named, noted that sweetened wines were correlated with gout, though he hadn't figured out the lead part. It seems likely that George R. Martin is trying to tell us that Viserys died of lead poisoning from too much lead-filled Hippocrates. And on a related note, the drink of choice for Circe in A Feast for Crows is also Hippocrates. And so maybe lead poisoning can help explain her growing insanity. Septon Eustace, writing on these events some years later, points out that the manservant delivered the dire tidings directly to the queen, and her alone, without raising a general alarm. Eustace does not believe that this was wholly fortuitous. The king's death had been anticipated for some time, he argues, and Queen Alicent and her party, the so-called Greens, had taken care to instruct all of Viserys' guards and servants in what to do when the day came. And so here we get a paragraph that's been edited a bit from The Princess and the Queen to Fire and Blood. As I mentioned, originally in The Princess and the Queen, not much attention was given to sourcing. This is largely a rogue prince invention. And so in the original text, this information is simply given as fact. 
a manservant delivered the tidings to Alicent, who had been anticipating it. George R. Martin has gone back and made this report from Septon Eustace. Now Eustace claims that Alicent had been anticipating the death, which, simply observing the actions of the Green Council later, seems pretty obvious. We didn't really need Septon Eustace's sourcing here, but it's mostly added as a balance to the coming added paragraph. The dwarf mushrooms suggest a more sinister scenario, whereby Queen Alicent hurried King Viserys on his way with a pinch of poison to his Hippocrats. It must be noted that Mushroom was not in King's Landing the night the king died, but rather on Dragonstone, in service with Princess Rhaenyra. And so here we get a Mushroom story that was not in the original Princess and the Queen. The king was actually poisoned by Alicent, Mushroom claims. This is a new addition, and it shows why there was a need for Eustace to frame the previous paragraph. It creates the he said, she said balance of Eustace Mushroom that we saw in the Rogue Prince. So this mushroom tale is obviously supposed to be seen as dubious, as Mushroom was not there. Despite the last chapter still saying that Mushroom was in King's Landing, entertaining the king near the end of his life. Of course, Mushroom was not present for nearly all of his stories, but they're still presented by Gildane. Now, despite the story being presented as false, there are certain elements of the story that ring true. Again, the gout and the regular drinking of Hippocrats does imply that Viserys perhaps died of lead poisoning. He was, in all probability, poisoned. Just gradually. The question really is whether the poisoning was intentional or accidental. It is almost certainly false that Alicent poisoned him here and now all at once, when there was little benefit to that. Earlier in time would have clearly been more advantageous, with Rhaenyra's children and their dragons being younger. Now, of course, there is a chance that the poisoning of Viserys was intentional and happened over a long period of time, but drawn-out plots would run the risk of being discovered more easily. The thing is, Sapa was a normal drink sweetener, and no one was forcing the king to drink Hippocrats as far as we can tell. It was the king's custom to drink the wine, not the maester's custom or Alicent's custom. Now, yes, it may be that the drink contains some sort of medicine, perhaps opium, to treat Viserys' gout, and thus the cure was actually contributing to the disease. But we don't actually have any evidence of this. From what we can tell, drinking Hippocrats was Viserys' choice. He liked the sweet wine and got lead poisoning over the course of many, many years. Queen Alicent went at once to the king's bedchamber, accompanied by Sir Criston Cole, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Once they had confirmed that Viserys was dead, Her Grace ordered his room sealed and placed under guard. The serving man who had found the king's body was taken into custody, to make certain he did not spread the tale. Sir Criston returned to White Sword Tower and sent his brothers of the Kingsguard to summon the members of the king's small council. It was the hour of the owl. And here things get very, very fishy. Now, as I have said, the Dance of the Dragons was a Hightower coup, and later on, the story attempts to frame the coup beginning with the so-called Green Council, where talks went until dawn. But in fact, this is not the whole story. There most certainly was an earlier meeting. A pre-Green Council council. Who attended this earlier meeting and what they discussed is unknown. But we know something happened and we know the meeting was rather lengthy. You see, Viserys was discovered during the Hour of the Bat, and the Kingsguard besides Cole were told of Viserys' death during the Hour of the Owl. That's a bit later. From the Dragon Tamer chapter in A Dance with Dragons, we know that the Hour of the Bat, when Viserys was discovered, comes before the Hour of the Eel and the Hour of Ghosts. We're not sure when the Hour of the Owl is, but it's at least after these which means the Kingsguard were alerted to the death three hours later. In fact, it may have been even longer, as the Hour of the Bat is just after sundown, and it's said that the Kingsguard roused the small council from their beds. It's abundantly clear that Alicent and Kristen Cole were doing something during this time, probably discussing their plans with Otto Hightower and perhaps others. The point being, when the Green Council actually convened, various members had already been scheming, at the pre-Green Council Council. Then, as now, the Sworn Brotherhood of the Kingsguard consisted of seven knights. 
men of proven loyalty and undoubted prowess, who had taken solemn oaths to devote their lives to defending the king's person and kin. Only five of the White Cloaks were in King's Landing at the time of Viserys' death. Sir Criston himself, Sir Arik Cargyle, Sir Rickard Thorne, Sir Stephen Darklin, and Sir Willis Fell. Sir Eric Cargyle, twin to Sir Arik, and Laurent Marbrand, with Princess Rhaenyra on Dragonstone, remained unaware and uninvolved as their brothers-in-arms went forth into the night to rouse the members of the small council from their beds. And so here we get a little roll call of who's in the Kingsguard at the time of Viserys' death, and we're told when they were informed of the death, in the night after people had fallen asleep. Now getting back to the sourcing issue, some may be wondering who the actual source is for all these events and the hours in which they took place. Well, we should remember that Kristen Cole was part of the conspiracy and would probably not be talking to Septon Eustace about things. He's also rather busy during the war and dies during the war, giving little opportunity to actually talk to Eustace. However, because Kristen Cole guards Alicent, a different Kingsguard would have been guarding the king. The Kingsguard on duty is the one who would know all of the timing and is basically our logical source for all of this. We know it wasn't Eric Cargyle or Laurent Marbrand as they were on Dragonstone, which leaves Stefan Darklin, Arik Cargyle, Rickard Thorne, and Willis Fell. Now, the source probably wasn't Stefan Darklin as he runs off to Dragonstone and dies soon after trying to mount a dragon. I mean, he had some time to spill the beans to Mushroom, but that doesn't seem that likely. Either it was Arik Cargyle, who we know in the Rogue Prince was feeding information to Septon Eustace, though he would have to tell Septon Eustace all of this information before his own death, which happens fairly early in the war. Or it could be Rickard Thorne, who dies a bit later in the war, though he's never listed as a source for anything else. We have no reason to believe he would suddenly start talking to Septon Eustace. Or it could be Willis Fell. Willis Fell actually survives the war and is listed as a source of events later on. It's likely he was the one who was on duty and is our primary source for much of this information. And this is a good place to stop. We'll continue on with the Green Council in part 29. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.